I'm Bob Short, and this is Reflections on Georgia Politics, sponsored by Young Harris College and the Richard B. Russell Library at the University of Georgia. Our guest is Tom Buck, longtime Columbus lawyer and civic leader who served 38 years in the Georgia General Assembly. Welcome, Tom. Thank you, Bob. It's a pleasure to be with you. With your permission, we'd like to divide our conversation into three parts. First, your early life in Columbus, then your service in the Georgia General Assembly, and finally, life after politics. Okay. But you were born right here in Columbus, I believe, in this very place we're sitting. Well, I was born on March the 2nd, 1938, and my mother and father lived in this house. And uh, we continued, I grew up in this area. I went to grammar school about three blocks up the road I graduated from, we got through grammar school, went to uh, Columbus High School, which is about three or four blocks from where we are. Graduated from high school in 1955. Um, went to Emory University, got a degree, uh, uh, majored in political science. I stayed on at Emory for another three years and got my law degree. And fortunately, when I got out of law school, I had passed the bar. And so I come back to Columbus to uh, pursue my dreams of practicing law. And I uh, was very fortunate to get involved with a, a fine, fine law firm. And, and we had an ex excellent uh, law practice. And I uh, was well known throughout the, not just Columbus, but throughout the, the state of Georgia. And um, I started practicing law with them, and like I said, in 62. 63 comes around, I have to go off to the military. So I go, uh, they make me, uh, instead of being a JAG officer, I turned out being a combat medic. <laughs> and uh, wound up uh, at Fort Sam Houston, Texas. But I was in the reserves and I had to continue to go to reserve meetings, you know, in the uh, summer, usually for two weeks and then one week in a month. And finally, I, uh, in 19, I want to say 1966 was when I had the opportunity to get elected to the Georgia House. But uh, living in this area was quite an experience. I had a paper route that started up at the Warren Grammar School and went all the way down past the Bradley Museum. And uh, also there was a grocery store up here about two blocks and I sat groceries on the weekends. And uh, my father had instilled in me a strong work ethnic, ethnic and, uh, and, and he had a lot to do with my future and, and life and what I was doing. And uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to go to law school and uh, get my own profession and not be involved with family and some family businesses because sometimes those are not very much fun. But uh, the, the uh, time of growing up in this area is fantastic. Now, when I moved here, my father still owned this place and it had been used as an insurance agent office. One time somebody lived here and then later on it became a decorator's office. And uh, I moved out here probably about 10 years ago or 15 years ago and uh, set up my own law practice here by myself. But it was the same house. I was born at the city hospital but I was brought to this house to grow up. When did you first get interested in politics? Well, I guess you would say, I don't know whether to, how, to, how to really say this. I, I, at Emory University, I ran for and got elected uh, president of my uh, freshman class. That was my first brush, brush with uh, politics as such. And, you know, I had some friends that were lawyers that, uh, here in Columbus that had served or were, were serving. And, hear these stories about, you know, the General Assembly and a little bit uh, about the House and a little bit about the Senate. And at that time in my life, I was uh, single. And uh, this was like in 1966. And um, a bunch of the younger lawyers used to get together downtown to the favorite pub and drink a few beers after lunch and, I mean, after, uh, after work and, uh, you know, get on with our business. Well, a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, a colleague of mine was Milton Jones, who was uh, serving in the House. 
And uh, I had grown up with Milton. I think he was a year or two ahead of me in grammar school and high school. His wife and I were in the same class in high school. Anyway, Milton comes in, the other guy's sitting around and says, uh, we got to find a candidate to run for the Georgia House. Representative Jack Brinkley is going to run for Congress. It's going to create an open seat. And we need to have some of our people in that seat. I need somebody to come up there and help me. And so we go around the room and everybody in the room, there must have been a dozen of us, uh, said, no, I can't do it. I've got two young children at home. or I can't afford it. And, or my job won't let me do this. And, and so it gets to me and uh, he says, uh, Buck, what about you? And I said, I don't know. I'd have to get permission from my bosses because I was not a partner, I was just a junior in the law firm. And uh, so I went back to the office and I talked to Mr. Howell Hollis, who had served in the state senate, and told him what I'd like to do and what was going on politically in Columbus about Brinkley deciding to run for the United States House of Representatives. And so he talked, Mr. Hollis talked to the other partners in the firm and we had a sizable firm at the time. There were about 12 or 13 of us in that law firm. And uh, the next morning, Mr. Hollis was calling back and said, well, said, I'm going to give you the green light. I've talked to all the partners, and they think it'll be good for you and it'll be good for our law practice. So the next morning, or that same morning after I got the green light, uh, we had a press conference that afternoon, and uh, this was in 66, 1966. And we announced what we were going to do and qualified at the proper time and got elected. Uh, did have opposition in that first uh, term, um, but I got elected and and went to, as a, and was sworn in officially in January of 1967. Do you remember your first campaign? Yeah, at that time, um, you know, people didn't spend the money or as much money to run a campaign on as far as advertising and whatnot as they do today. In today's world, it's uh, just gotten where it's out of, out of whack, in my personal opinion. But uh, I um, had the, we had at-large seats. At that time, we had seven House members from Columbus and two state senators. And my district that I was going that ran for and got elected was an at-large, so I had the whole county of Muskogee as constituency. And uh, then later we get to uh, where we, reapportionment and whatnot, we went to single member districts. But uh, I, I went in, as, as I said, as a, uh, had the whole county. So my experience in, in the campaign was I had a pretty good family name. Our family's always, Buck family's always been very involved in civic affairs and supportive of things that have led to the betterment of this area. And uh, I felt like it was something I could do to give back to the community because they would have been good to me, my father, and my grandfather. And um, so I, I took it from there. And ultimately, during the election, when I found out I had opposition, the fellow running against me had qualified by petition. And uh, I worked the whole county. I went everywhere. I went to residences and knocking on doors and subdivisions during the week. And on the weekends, I might, uh, you know, go knock on doors and again and uh, try to build up some sense of uh, where people knew who I was and knew the name, knew the background, and had confidence enough to elect me in that particular race. And in that year, the Democratic Party in Georgia was a very, very conservative bunch and uh, very few Republican members in the House and the Senate. And um, I got uh, qualified, got elected, and stayed there 38 years. And my political philosophy always stayed the same from the day I started to the day I quit. Uh, I would be probably classified now as more of a Republican than a Democrat. But uh, we ran and had a very successful race uh, but the personal contacts had very little advertising. I had some signboards around town. Uh, had a few few uh, bumper stickers, and uh, maybe had an ad or two on the radio, and maybe an ad or two on the on the TV. But uh, I, it made me a better person to have to run for an at-large seat because I got to know more people in this community, 
and uh, fortunately, and uh, met a lot of good people in this community, and they were very supportive, and were supportive all all the time I stayed up there. So in 1967, you went to Atlanta to begin what turned out to be 38 years in the General Assembly. What was it like to be a freshman legislator? Well, um, I'll tell you this story. One of my partners in law practice told me after I'd gotten elected, he said, son, when you go up there now, I said, keep your mouth shut, listen, and make as many friends as you can. And uh, I subscribed to that theory and it paid dividends over the years. And I even moved into, I think I've mentioned before, that uh, in, in treating people, regardless of race, color, or creed, I had this philosophy, and I think it comes from my background and growing up, but I treated people like I wanted people to treat me, regardless of sex or political party or affiliation, and made many, many friends over a period of time I was there. and. Uh, very fortunate to kind of move up the ladder in a short period of time. I had a wonderful relationship with the late George L. Smith, who was speaker when I went there, and at that time was the, a very historical time in the state of Georgia politically. We had to, a General Assembly had to elect a governor. We had a joint, the way the, the way the morning started, we were all sworn in, and then we had to elect a, a speaker and a speaker pro tem and whatnot clerk, and this was when George L. And he got a group together and we decided to divorce the House and the Senate from the direct control of the governor's office, which we did, and uh, which was, I thought was a, a great, great thing for the, for the people, really, because you had such a handful of people running state government before we divorced ourselves from the governor's office that uh, it, it, it just kind of left a bad taste in your mouth. Well, anyway, we had, on that first day, it was the second Monday in January, after we t took the oath of office, and after we elected the, uh, the speakers and speaker pro tems and whatnot, then we had a joint session with the Senate and a roll call vote on who you wanted to vote for, for governor. At that time, uh, Lester Maddox, and Bo, Howard Bo Calloway were the two candidates. Uh, Muskogee County had gone uh, real strong for Bo Calloway. Uh, he had uh, he was Republican, but Bo had uh, been our congressman here in the third district and was well known in this community and surrounding counties. And so, um, when the time came for the roll call, I didn't have any choice other than to vote for. I thought at that time. Uh, Bo Calloway, and out of the delegation we had of uh, seven House members and two senators here in Muskogee, we had one member that voted for Mr. Maddox, and the rest of us voted for Bo Calloway. Uh, I would say uh, George Busby voted for Bo Calloway, former Governor Busby, mm -hmm. and uh, that was a historical, very historical part of our history, uh, and, and it was a new tone and a, a new day the way the General Assembly operated and worked. And uh, my first few years, I was just pretty much trying to learn what to do and how to do and who to do. And uh, it paid dividends. I established an excellent relationship with Speaker George L. Smith, who uh, was Speaker for several years until his death, untimely death, I might say. And uh, he kind of boosted my career up to the point where when he left us, I had been placed, I had a chairmanship of a standing House committee. I was on the Appropriations Committee, I was on the uh, Rules Committee, and also uh, a committee we used to call the Green Door Committee, and uh, which was a small group of, in a sanctum that made a lot of policy. And so I have to thank, with deep affection, my relationship with the then Speaker. And of course, when he died, we had to elect a new speaker, which at that time, we all flew down to Swainsboro. I say we all did. Most of the members of the General Assembly either drove or flew. I was fortunate I got to fly. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a big, big funeral. And we had been, I'd been to Swainsboro before to play in a golf tournament down there and had gotten to know George L. pretty well. But uh, when he died, then the, the race was between Tom Murphy and 
and, and uh, George Busby. And uh, so we get home from Swainsboro and I get a call from Sloppy Floyd, who was a chairman of the Appropriations Committee in the House. And he came from Tron, Georgia, up in North Georgia. But he was a great friend of the speakers and others there that were in leadership positions. And I get this phone call from Sloppy Floyd and he said, boys, uh, a deal's been struck. He said, George Bowdy's gonna run for governor and Tom Murphy's gonna support him in that endeavor. And uh, Tom Murphy's gonna run for speaker and George Busby's gonna support him in that race. And so that's how we got home and we get this phone call. Well, I had known Mr. Murphy. I you know, never had really many, much dealings with him at the time. Uh, at that time, uh, he was speaker pro tem. And uh, my friends and I get on the phone and we call Mr. Murphy and to congratulate him and tell him we were all for him and tried to get in on the ground floor. And my relationship with Tom Murphy was excellent. Uh, he uh, helped me in my whole career until he retired and uh, for some reason had some confidence in me and put me in important places that George L. had, but living there without George L. and then having Tom Murphy, uh, I eventually served as chairman of the uh, Committee on Higher Education, which we call at that time the University System Committee. I served uh, as chairman of the House Retirement Committee. Uh, then I served as chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee for many, many years. And then finally, uh, I served my last term as chairman of the House Appropriations Committee. So I had a pretty f full schedule. Uh, mm -hmm. the long, and never dreamed I would stay there that long. Thought maybe a couple of terms would be, that'd be all I'd be interested in. And uh, I wasn't married though, so I could do pretty much be away from home without distur disturbing uh, the sanctity of a household. But later on in life, uh, I did get married, and uh, I don't mind telling you, it, uh, it sometimes, uh, I, I knew it was time to come home because I was spending so much time in Atlanta away from Susan and my family here in Columbus. Even though the legislature only meets 40 days, and we used to say 40 days and 80 nights, <laughs> but. Uh, 40 days would sometime extend into 60 days, uh, you know, depending on recesses and whatnot. But um, I had a full, full career and I made a lot of good friends. Let's back up a minute, if you will, to 1966 and the race for governor, uh, in which you had some pretty heavy candidates in the Democratic primary, uh, which was uh, finally won by Lester Maddox. And then you had the race between Maddox and a Republican Bo Calloway. Uh, did you have a favorite in that race? Well, I guess I would. I had a favorite, and it was Bo Calloway because I knew Mr. Calloway and knew what he had done in the past and knew his family history, and he had been a congressman in this area, and so I had gotten to know him through that uh, relationship. And so I guess, yes, I did, but I was still, if being, I don't think I was being disloyal. Somebody would say I was being dis disloyal to vote for the Republican and not the Democrat. I guess it got down to personalities and I was more impressed with Mr. Calloway and what he could do than I was Mr. Maddox. I always got along with Mr. Maddox. He was quite a character. And uh, he always called me Iceman. He couldn't remember Tom Buck, <laughs> but we owned, the family owned a Buck Ice and Coal Company. He could remember that. so. See Governor Maddox, even after he went over and was Lieutenant Governor, and I'd see him around, he'd say, all right, doing ice, man. I'd say, fine, Governor, good to see you. So I got along and respected, and I think Lester Maddox did an outstanding job as Governor, a lot better than a lot of people thought he was going to do. He made some excellent appointments to uh, some positions that uh, opened the doors for people that you wouldn't think Maddox would do from what you read in the newspaper. But uh, he, he performed pretty well. Before we get too far down the line, I want to ask you about your relationship with uh, Speaker Murphy. Well, Speaker Murphy, when he took over as Speaker, you know, the Speaker usually has the authority to name committee chairs and whatnot. And, uh, so I was, of course, interested in hoping he was not going to do away with my job. And he called me one day and said, Buck, said, uh, I want you to take over the House Committee on uh, Higher Education, uh, University System. He said, you know, said, 
we've had Chapel Matthews here for a long time. Chapel's left us, gone. And uh, I want somebody that can run the committee, but also is not committed to the University of Georgia and Georgia Tech. I want somebody that's independent from those institutions and said, you got your law degree in uh, education, formal education at Emory University. So I felt like, I feel like that you could do a job well done and still make sure that everybody was treated fairly. And I quite, I really enjoyed that, that chairmanship. You got to meet a lot of good people. Uh, we were dealing with presidents of universities and colleges in Georgia, uh, the Board of Regents, which is made up of some outstanding people. Uh, and over the years, I got, got real involved in it. And uh, then we put a new system in as far as uh, financing higher education. And George Busby was governor, and he put me on that commission uh, and we came back with a plan on how we were going to allocate funds for different categories and different institutions. And, you know, I was happy as a pig in slop with that. I got to go to all the football games and sit in the president's box <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and established a good relationship with a lot of people that worked with the university system and at Georgia Tech as well as the University of Georgia. Uh, Murphy. That was a, a step up as far as I was concerned. It had a little more prestige than being chairman of the retirement committee. And then one day uh, I get this phone call and it's Tom Murphy and he calls me Bucko. How you doing? And I wasn't doing too well. I was sick. I think I had the flu. And he said, the reason I'm calling is I want you to take over the chairmanship of the House Ways and Means Committee. And said, I know you and I know how mean you can be. And said, you can be the one that doesn't have a problem saying no to somebody. And that's what I need. And I uh, said, uh, Bill Dovo was the chairman at that time and he has resigned to take a job with the Public Service Commission. And uh, I said, well, Mr. Murphy, I said, I appreciate this. It's quite flattered, but I said, can I let you know tomorrow? Can I sleep on it? And I said, you know, I never served on Ways and Means. And he said, well, all right, said, uh, sleep on it. Let me know something first thing in the morning because I've got to make a decision. And don't tell anybody that I've called you about this. And I said, no, sir. So I got home that afternoon late. Got to thinking, well, Murphy had done a lot for me. And if he's asking me to do something for him, I've got to do it. So I called him at home in Bremen, got him on the phone, told him I thought it out and uh, would be happy to take over that chairmanship, And which uh, he said, well, I appreciate it. And said, I've got to make some other changes. And I'll let you know when you can say something about this to the public. So about two days went by and he made the announcement. He moved Calvin Smyre, who's from Columbus, in as chair of uh, higher education. And then he took somebody, I can't remember somebody else, and filled in. Calvin had a, a chairmanship of, I think, industrial relations at that time. He moved out of that, took over higher education, and Speaker Murphy put somebody else in for that committee at that time. And uh, it's quite an experience. Uh, chairing that committee. A lot well, tell of us about the committee and what you do, what the committee well, did. you know, uh, under the Constitution of the State of Georgia and uh, the, all your bills that are introduced that affect revenue and taxes are uh, assigned to the Ways and Means Committee. And uh, so you get a lot of uh, visitors and lobbyists coming in to see you about certain pieces of legislation or, and members. And what, what I did as chairman, we had uh, um, I had a good staff that had worked in that committee, particularly a lady named Monty Sellers. She had uh, been working in that as not just secretary, but you know maybe a little more of a higher up job than that. But she probably knew more tax law related to Georgia than anybody else in the capital would. And so I had her to help me and, and show me around a little bit till I got where I was comfortable enough and. Felt like I could run the committee the way I wanted to run it, and didn't make a whole lot of changes. But we set up a subcommittee system where any legislation that was introduced, that was referred to Ways and Means, I would uh, set up three or four different subcommittees, and I'd, I'd assign the legislation to those committees, let them have full hearings, public hearings on the issues, especially those that were complicated or controversial. Uh, some of the legislation was uh, easy, you know. Uh, but we were very careful. Uh, we, we worked closely with the Revenue Department 
as to revenues and how they were coming in and from which source and whatnot. And it was an education in itself to see how state government was being funded and how it was being paid for. Um, it was hard work. And, uh, and I guess I was able to do that without um, causing any problems. And I uh, thank Tom Murphy, and I thank Tom Murphy for, for giving me the opportunity to do that. But I think on top of that, the highest, highest honor I got, ever received as far as being involved was being named as uh, chairman of the Appropriations Committee, mm -hmm. which was a, a real interesting and uh, it's a full-time job. And, uh, but I enjoyed it. Let's enjoyed talk it. about that. The, the, the appropriation process in Georgia actually begins in the governor's office, is that not right? That's correct. With the budget estimate. That's the right. Revenue estimate. Right. How does it go from there? Well, the governor's uh, got floor leaders and whatnot in the House and in the Senate. And all tax, all revenue bills have to go through the Ways and Means Committee uh, as far as any tax is concerned. But uh, on appropriations, the governor would introduce a bill. Which we normally had two bills on appropriations. We had supplemental appropriations bill, which the fiscal year starts on July the 1st and expires on June the 30th. Well, sometimes we had some things we want to change, and so we'd have a, a supplemental budget bill that we would address first. And that would go through the process of passing the House Appropriations Committee uh, going to the Senate for them to do whatever they want to it, getting back into what we call a conference committee where there are three House members, three Senate members that deal with the differences between the two bodies as to what the final version of the budget's going to be. And then we pass that and the next we take up the same process, we take up the, the, uh, fiscal, the next fiscal year's budget, the big budget as we call it. And uh, this, this was uh, real interesting. We'd have the uh, Governor come in and make a speech as to what he wanted and, and what, why he had proposed, what he had and whatnot. And we'd have department heads from every branch of state government come in to joint meetings with the Senate Appropriations Committee to talk about finances, taxes, appropriations, allocations, whatever. And then ultimately it would be the three House members and the three Senate members would agree on what we call a conference committee report. and. Then that report went to every senator and every house member, and we take a vote up or down on whether or not to accept the conference committee report, that it become law, or whether we had to go back and negotiate some more. It took a lot of time, but it was also interesting too. You could see you know, department heads come in that you never would see except maybe once a year, and it was important in representing your constituency to be able, on a constituent's call on a problem they've got with the state, for me to know somebody I could call in some department or some department and say, hey, this is Tom Buck, and my got a constituent's got a problem, and I want to see if you can give me some guidance or some help. And most of the time, uh, the department heads were, were, were easy to get along with or, or could explain certain things that we as legislators didn't really know. Uh, but it was a full-time job. I mean, I, you know, the legislature's set to go for 40 days. They always recess. Uh, this year they've recessed two or three times uh, because they're having a problem, a recent agreement on the budget. And with the present economic status that we are in right now, I can understand. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be tough on those guys to have to vote to hopefully not raise any new taxes, but to cut areas that need to be cut for the time being and still maintain state government at a good level, and including education. And, you mentioned the Green Door Committee. Uh, define that for us. Well, um, the Green Door Committee was not a, a, a real committee. But the Green Door Committee was kind of the, what I'd like to look at and I say with affection, the good old boys that were on the Green Door Committee would really make a lot of the decisions that would go directly to the um, speakers office and also to the rules committee as far as what we wanted to do on this matter or that matter. It wasn't just confined to appropriations and tax laws. And there were probably about 10 to 12 of us on that and we would meet behind the green door as the media called it the green door but it was really behind Tom Murphy's office in a conference room where we'd sit around the table and 
I think he liked to call it the, the policy committee more than it was not, it really wasn't a committee. But uh, the, your, your leaders, like your chairman of uh, Ways and Means, Appropriations, uh, University System, whatnot, get together at the beck and call of the boss, who was Tom Murphy, and we'd sit there and go over certain things that we f liked about what was going on here or what we better not do over there. And you could get a lot done with a smaller group. Right. And uh, even though it probably was uh, not wide open, you know, nobody could just walk in the Greenville room without permission. So. Right. You mentioned conference committees on the appropriations bills. You've served there. Uh, tell us what happens in those negotiations. Well, uh, what, what you find yourself in is uh, the House has passed a bill on the budget. The Senate has passed a bill on the budget, which has its differences from the House's position on certain matters. And it winds up where the Senate disagrees with the House bill and the House committee disagrees with the Senate bill, so it goes into what's called a conference committee. And that means under the rules of the House that or procedure and whatnot, that, that the uh, lieutenant governor appoints three senators, usually the chairman of the committee and two others, to the conference committee, and the speaker appoints three, and he would appoint the chairman of the appropriations committee, uh, and also t uh, Terry Coleman, who was uh, a longtime member of the House, and Larry Walker. And I served on conference committees for, I guess, 25 28 years I was on Budget Conference Committee, which was quite uh, interesting. It was a very powerful position to be in. Uh, you could uh, do some things for some folks that uh, normally nobody else could do. And I meant like getting some funds for a certain project in Columbus, Georgia, for instance, or getting money for... Uh, earmarks. Yeah, yeah, earmarks. And uh, which I don't know whether that's a good idea now or not. but. Uh, it was it was a honor to serve on that and be involved in it and and the whole time I was there was uh, Terry Coleman was uh, on the conference committee and Larry Walker and and me and uh, the way I was put on was because Bubba McDonald who had been chairman of the House Appropriations Committee decided he wanted to run for governor and so there was a vacancy uh, there as far as, as that position was concerned so. Tom Murphy appointed me to take Bubba's place on on the conference committees, and uh, you know you had the supplemental conference committee and your regular budget conference committee. So, and it also taught you a lot about where 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 money's going and who's spending money and what they're spending it for, whether it be DOT or you know certain money is already dedicated to DOT, mm -hmm. Department of Transportation, the Revenue Department here, Corrections over here, um, just a university system, who's getting what, even though the university system uh, under the law, Board of Regents has got final say-so over what they gonna, how they're going to spend the money that's appropriated to them. But uh, it, it, was a, it was kind of a high-profile position. How long does it take to, to negotiate a final budget? Well, when you've got... Uh, when your financial situation is in good shape, I mean in the economy, like it was up until about three years ago, and it started going downhill, it's pretty easy because you had you had excess funding and uh, no problems, and uh, we try to be responsible, but also uh, accommodate things that we felt like needed to be funded, or more funded or whatnot. Now, on the other end of the coin, when you find yourself in a position like we're in now. The budget cuts are going to affect higher education, they're going to affect public, public education, school teachers, state employees, public safety, you name it, even DOT. Uh, one thing that concerns me a lot of, I've always been uh, pro-law enforcement or pro-public safety uh, for my whole legislative career. I believe strongly in maintaining the Department of Public Safety at, at its highest level. Now they're in the process of having to take cuts and cut back on what they're doing, which affects the safety of the public uh, down the road. And um, I know they're trying to do the best they can with what they got, but you know, some things I think are more important than other things are. What I think is important may be 
you don't think so, you might think something else. But that's human. There's nothing wrong with that. But uh, I'm just hopeful that uh, personally that in the next couple of years that things are going to get back to where they used to be. And then if they do, then we can come back or they can come back and uh, address some of these cut problems that they're going through now. So it's not fun time to be in the Georgia General Assembly under these circumstances where you got to say no to a lot of people. And a lot of these people saying no to are your friends. And, you know, you just can't do it. And hopefully the, the uh, general public and the voters understand, you know, that if you don't have it, you can't pay for it. Because we have to live under what we call a balanced budget. We can't go in debt. Or we sell bonds or something like that. But it's, uh, it's real tight right now. Real Everybody's tight. talking taxes. Does yeah. Georgia's tax system need overhauling? Well, I'm sure that we probably could create a special committee to study and come back with some recommendations. I'm sure there's some things that have been on the books for a long time that probably need to be uh, re-examined or examined to see if they're fulfilling the purposes of why it was put on or what it's generating or what it would do if you eliminate that program and put another program over here. Uh, so your, your tax situation is, is uh, not a lot of people understand that and, and uh, there no reflection on anybody's integrity or intelligence. But, you know, you take an average le legislator, unless he spent some time, he or she do not know that much about the tax structure in the state of Georgia or the budget process. So it's uh, probably something that uh, they might ought to take a look at. And I've seen in the news media this last several months since the General Assembly is in session that uh, things have been proposed and some tax increases in this area and some decreases over here, whatnot. But it's a, it's a bad time for, it's, it's not the best time in the world for the state of Georgia as far as a financial situation. Is I don't think people understand that, uh, that when the budget goes up, you know, the revenues must increase or you've got to cut the budget. That's right. One of the two. And it's a difficult, you can't give tax uh, breaks in periods where that's the case, like, like it is today. Uh, I guess one, one response might be a more efficient government, but that too is a, is a can of worms. Well, you know, in the past, uh, I think Governor Perdue's created some type of commission to go in and uh, look at the t tax structure in Georgia and come back and recommend to his office what changes they think could be done or, or should be done. They would change a few things so, and trying to eliminate waste in government, so to speak. So paying for things we really don't need to be paying for, doing things we don't really need to be doing. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something that, you know, it sounds good. Let's take a look at it and see if we can. But it's something that really ought to be looked at oh, at least every five years or so, mm -hmm. or maybe every ten years. But... Uh, in good times, you don't think too much about that. And only when we go through hard times like we are now is when you well, really I don't think you think uh, either, Tom, about uh, what, what the loss of jobs and, uh, and, and that part of the economy, uh, what effect that has on us because 45% of our annual revenue is from income taxes. Right. And, and the other, I think that's about 35% is from sales tax. Sales tax. And you, well, got you aren't your making other. money and you aren't spending money, then that certainly is going to affect your revenue stream. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good. I think that uh, history would require me to ask you about the great feud between our friend Speaker Murphy and our friend Lieutenant Governor Miller. Well, it's interesting you bring that up. Uh, it was one of those days the legislature was in session. The House side had finished its business for the day. The Senate was still in uh, session. And the, the good old boys were back in the, behind the green door. And <laughs> Speaker Murphy had summoned us to talk about the supplemental budget and the conference <laughs> committee report. Remind, rem, reminding, you know, that the conference committee was made up of three senators and three House members. 
and they had a position on certain items in the budget, and we had. And we were trying to resolve these differences, and it's kind of like a dog and pony show. You go in, you meet, public meeting and whatnot, you go through things, and eventually you get down to, to, the, to the, you know, not much left to do, to, to, to put it to bed and adopt it. And uh, on this particular occasion, uh, Tom Murphy and myself and Larry Walker, Terry Coleman, and I think maybe Bill Lee were sitting back in the conference room, in Speaker Murphy's conference room, and he brings it up and says, well, boys, tell us what's going on with the budget, what's going on with the conference committee. And uh, Terry was chairman of the Appropriations Committee, so he was a spokesman, and he said, well, Mr. Speaker, said, we've got uh, several items that we want that they won't let us have, and we've got several items that they won't, we won't let them have, but if we can agree on some certain things, we'll give some, and they'll give some, we can wrap this thing up. And uh, he said, well, I'll tell you what, fellas, said, let's go over and see the lieutenant governor and see if we can talk to him about this thing. And so uh, bear in mind that Speaker Murphy was not particularly fond of lieutenant governor uh, at Pier, Pier Howard, and Pier Howard was not particularly fond of Speaker Tom Murphy. So we go over there, and the Senate's still in session. We go in the side door, side room, and we walk down front and stand by the podium, and the lieutenant governor's presiding, and he lets uh, us sit there, and I'm more, I think, uh, because of Murphy than anything else, and lets him cool his heels for about 15 minutes before he comes over to the end of the podium and says, yes, sir, Mr. Speaker, what can I do for you? And uh, so Murphy says, well, Governor, so we're trying to get this thing resolved. We've gotten this far. We've got very little left to do, but your people want this, and your, our people want that. And if we, and we're as a stalemate, and if we can give you some things, you can give us some things, and we can put this thing to bed. And uh, Lieutenant Governor Howard looked at Murphy and said, well, I'm sorry, Mr. Speaker, uh, I can't do that. And with that, Murphy said, well, I tell you what, Governor, said, you can just KMA. Come on, boys, let's go. <laughs> and we were like little ducks walking out of the Senate chamber back over to Murphy's office. But uh, anyway, it got resolved in the next couple of days, and we went on to something else. But that was a, that was a funny, funny thing to me that happened. You know Tom Murphy is probably as well as anybody. Uh, did you find him as tough and insensitive as the media tried to make him out to be? No. You know, the media tried to make him look like a redneck lawyer from the country. And the leg, red, redneck lawyer from the country was plenty smart. Uh, I think Tom Murphy was, uh, did more for the state of Georgia than anybody I know of in his time that he was there. And he um, was hard-nosed, but he also had a strong religious background where he was good to people and wanted to help people, people less fortunate. And you could see this good side of Tom Murphy, I could because I was around him a lot, that the media wouldn't pay any attention to. And uh, there are a lot of things that he did for this state that would not be here today if it hadn't been for Tom Murphy. Uh, like the, the uh, Georgia Dome and, and, and several facilities, uh, Turner Field, um, you know, some of these other big things. It didn't do anything to help him in his legislative district, but it helped the state of Georgia. And he had this ability to work well with people as far as uh, race or gender. And if you noticed when he was speaker, he, he had pretty much stacked deck as far as having uh, certain people from urban areas involved in the committee process in a high position, certain people from the rural areas, uh, certain people, situations with the, the black community and the white community and the rich and the poor. So he was, he was really, uh, in my, my opinion, was unduly crucified by the media, but we got to accept it and he got to accept it and just didn't worry about it because uh, he, he, he was fair and square 
to everybody. I mean, even uh, the opposition party, he was, in my opinion, was always fair to him. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, was, he could be a very gentle person. Were you surprised when he was defeated uh, in uh, 2002 after 28 years as Speaker? I was kind of surprised, but when you look at when you look at the census and you see where the districts are redrawn, which we are obligated to do by law every 10 years, that uh, Murphy's <coughs> district didn't look like it was the district he, he was he was going to have a hard time getting reelected, and he could have put a stop to that if he wanted to. He could have. Uh, Put anything in that bill, that appropriate, uh, that uh, reinforcement bill, that related to his seat, that would make him be favorable rather than not favorable, because he was the boss. He was the boss man, and he's going to say, "All right, I want this, this, and this," and y'all argue over the rest of it. And you say, "Yes, sir, Mr. Speaker, that's fine with us," because we're all kind of looking after each other's. Uh, const you know, as to where the incumbent is and where he's going to be under this new, new, new plan, but it wasn't a, a real shock to me. No, that he, he got defeated. Uh, I had an occasion to visit with him on several, uh, several times after he uh, was defeated, and um, he came to the Capitol every now and then, and we'd see him and visit with him. And of course, when he uh, expired, you know. I, we, we uh, were all involved, I say we were all, some of us were involved in being a part of the, the uh, I want to say the funeral, it wasn't necessarily the funeral, but it was an honor, a day of honoring Tom Murphy in the house. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had several people there that made speeches about him and it was a sad day mm -hmm. to see Murphy go. And, you know, he died and um, I think I think you know, had he been still in the, running the show, so to speak, he'd still be with us today. Um, you know, but he wouldn't want to not be here and be involved. And so maybe he's happy that he's gone to glory. Um, had an occasion last week, a couple of weeks ago, they had a, a portrait unveiling of Tom Murphy in the Georgia House. And they invited some of us older fellows that had been there in his group to come up and sit. And it was nice seeing some of Speaker Murphy's uh, relatives, you know, his granddaughters and grandson, his son, and his daughters, sons, and grandchildren. And uh, it made you just think about the, about the old man. You know, you could just look at him and start thinking about different things that he had been involved in as far as I was concerned or something. It would. He had helped me with a project for Columbus or, or whatnot. What do you remember most about him? Well, I, I, I guess one of the th things that I'll always remember is the cigar and the Stetson hat. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, he, he didn't smoke the cigar. He chewed on cigars, and so did Bill Lee at that time, and they would always steal cigars from each other. And, uh, but he would chomp on that cigar and finally get it down to just a butt, and he'd throw it away and then get another one and just start <laughs> chewing on it. And then when he'd come in the Capitol in the morning, he always got there about 8 o'clock. And it was in, of course, January, and the weather was cold. He'd have a top coat on, overcoat, and this big Stetson cowboy hat on. And he would put that thing in and keep it on until he got to his office. He'd take his hat off and put it over in a chair. And uh, I was thinking about that the other day when I was going through a closet of mine at home and Tom Murphy gave me one of those Stetson hats one time and he gave Crawford Ware, who was a longtime legislator from up in Hogansville. So Crawford and I had two Tom Murphy hats, you know, and I'm not a hat man, I never have been really a hat man where I kept playing golf. but. Uh, you know, that, that's something I remember about him. It will always stay in the back of my mind. Not this, that, or the other, but this was just a little levity. And uh, you could tell him, you ask him a question, and he'd put that cigar in there and chomp on it a few minutes before he give you an answer. Now, he was thinking the whole time he was chewing. You know. But uh, he loved a good cigar. 
Did you ever have breakfast with Marcus? Used to go over to Marcus's about. That's uh, Marcus Collins. Marcus Collins, former member of the House, Chairman of Ways and Means, uh, later Revenue Commissioner. He and Speaker Murphy were very close friends. I'd say they were uh, probably closer than anybody over there. And they had this uh, tradition where somebody would have a breakfast meeting every morning in a hotel room, and uh, you'd come in there and eat some eggs if you wanted to, or some cake, uh, coffee, or orange juice, whatnot. And they had it every morning, uh, Monday through Friday. And you had to be invited to, to go. And uh, I was always invited. And they had it at the old Marriott uh, Hotel, which I stayed there for 20 years and then moved up to the new Marriott, stayed up there another 20 years. And uh, so I just drive, it's the only way to Capitol, just drive up and park and go in there and shoot the bull and you'd see all kind of funny people or good people. And Murphy would always come in, you know, and, uh, have a cup of coffee and shoot, talk to the guys that were in the room before he'd leave to go to the Capitol, but it was it was kind of a traditional thing. But I would try to get over at least twice a week. But I, I always went to the Capitol. Well, they had, they had that, have that thing set up where you could go in about 6.30 in the morning. And I, I always tried to be at the Capitol my whole career at seven o'clock in the morning. I could get more work done, especially when I had ways and means and appropriations. I could get more work done between seven o'clock and nine o'clock than I could the rest of the day because my time was moved doing other things. And so you could go by there and maybe get some feeling about what the topic of the day was going to be or what happened the day before. And uh, Marcus was in charge of the food and uh, and uh, Murphy would come in, of course, and everybody would kiss the ring. And uh, it's just it was just a good way to start your day off to come in there and see these guys. and. I'm thinking about, you know, a lot of the older members that are no longer there would come by. Mm -hmm. and uh, But you had to, you know, you were invited to come. You're not just drop in on your own. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you served with seven governors. Yes, sir. Afraid so. Let's talk about some of them. What was your uh, impression? We've talked about Lester Maddox, who had no governmental experience. Who had uh, who knew very few members of the legislature, who knew none of the department heads, agency heads. Uh, how would you rate his administration, Lester? You know, Lester. Uh, we know him as a with his Pickwick restaurant and his axe handles and uh, showmanship, like riding bicycle backwards. Um, but Lester really was a better governor than most people give him credit for. And I say that in that he uh, was painted a racist, but he really wasn't. And uh, he made some outstanding appointments to positions that he had the authority to appoint. Some of his appointments were excellent and not what you would think that he would do on courts, courts of appeal, court, Supreme Court, uh, border regents things like that, and he was more, he liked to go out, he, he, he was kind of a showman, you know, and uh, like I told Jerry, he called me Iceman, <laughs> and uh, I, we had one member in our delegation that voted for him, and he was the man that had to go to the governor for Columbus, Georgia, not, Tom Buck couldn't do anything, because Tom Buck voted for both Calloway, <laughs> and uh, so anyway, after, you know, he had he had some good staff, some real good staff around him, and uh, you know he he was uh, not a bad governor at all. Uh, I thought I think uh, each governor I served under had different. Of course, you and I have different personalities, but you take uh, I never did get very close to Luster. I never got close to to uh, President Carter, um, even though he's right down the road here in Plains. Uh, that got along super well with the. Joe Frank, Harris, and he was Murphy's boy. Mm -hmm. And uh, Joe Frank would pretty much walk the line on what Murphy wanted to do. And um, I guess uh, You George, served with Busby. Uh, Busby was one of my favorites. At that time, it, I had known Busby in the house. 
he'd been majority leader, I'd been involved in leadership. And um, I just had this great feeling for him. And uh, easy to get to, I mean, not get to, but to, to, to get in to see and talk about things. And uh, just, a, just a hail fellow well met. And for example, I could, if I wanted to go see the governor, I didn't have to go through the governor's out of office. I could go around the back way and come in and slip in and talk to George whenever I wanted to, and it's the same way with him. And uh, I thought so much of him. He, he was good to us as a delegation and good to Muskogee County. And then the other one that I have just feel real strong about was Roy Bonds. Mm -hmm. And uh, Roy was an outstanding governor, and quite frankly, um, he deserved a, a second term. But Roy, biggest mistake, he was trying to do too many things too quick. If you look back on the race for governor when she lost to Sonny Perdue, our present governor, um, if you look back on it, he could have withheld taking up the bill that changed the Georgia flag, put it over for his next term. Um, he could have done some other things, delayed things, and, and it would not be so controversial that would get him in the posture where he got beaten. Mm -hmm. And uh, but had the same kind of relationship with Roy as it did with George Busby. I can get in and see him anytime I wanted to through the back door, mm -hmm. and uh, that made you feel good. You could do stuff like that, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't think Sonny has uh, done a real bad job as governor. He's inherited some problems that he can't do anything about, but. He's a little bit uh, different than, than uh, Roy was mm -hmm. and, and the others. Um, I remember when Jimmy Carter got def uh, time for him to step aside. I went by his office on the second floor to go outside where they were going to have the <coughs> inaugural services for the governor. And there wasn't a soul in there with Jimmy Carter sitting in his office by himself. And I went over to speak to him, told him I enjoyed serving under him. And, wished him the very best in the future. But he didn't have anybody with him. He just mm -hmm. lonesome in there waiting to go out and turn the mm -hmm. keys to state government over somebody. Tom, in 2004, you decided to step down as the senior member of the House uh, with 38 consecutive years in office. Why did you decide to hang it up? Well, <clears throat> There were several reasons, but uh, one thing, I just did not like the way things were going at the State House. Um, I was still a conservative Democrat. Uh, the Republicans are t making strides, and eventually you could see that they were going to take over the House and the Senate and the government. And I just didn't want to be involved in all that, that uh, unpleasantness. And also, I had been there so long, and it was kind of like I, I, my wife and I have been married about 17 years and uh, I was never at home and it was not, it, it, it takes a lot of dedication for somebody to stay in public service that long and maintain a good relationship at home with family, wives, children, stepchildren, grandchildren. And uh, I'm fortunate to have married a very fine lady and she enjoyed uh, my being in the General Assembly up to a point, but I could always see uh, when the session would always start in January, when I'd leave to go to Atlanta on that Sunday before the Monday, she had a smile on her face and said, oh, it's good to have a good trip, sweetheart, I'll see you. Well, then about the month would go by and then that little smile started disappearing on <laughs> Sundays when I'd leave to go back. And then towards the end, it was uh, she had a lip out. So that, that was a small consideration, but really I felt like I needed to be at home more than I was. And I was tired of it, and, and I could see it was going to be very unpleasant with the way things were, were, were going. I, I had been, I still am, a conservative Democrat. Uh, the Republican Party, the governor even called and said, we want you to uh, consider changing parties, and if you'll run as a Republican, uh, we'll guarantee that you stay as chair of appropriations and rules and where you are, which was, you know, something to think about. Well, I got to thinking about that. And, and then I felt like, well, if I switch parties, I'd have to resign my chairmanship as uh, chairman of appropriations, and that wouldn't, I couldn't, or either I'd probably get uh, fired. And, and, uh, 
But Terry Coleman and I were real good friends and have been since he came. I used to be called the baby chairman. I was the youngest chairman. And uh, when Terry got appointed to a championship, he was, after, he was the new baby chairman. And so I talked it over with family and I talked over with uh, several good close friends. And I felt like that, you know, you've, you've fought a good fight and you've done a good job, you think. And you've uh, made your contribution to society and you have paid back the community for all the good things the community has done for you. Just, there's numerous reasons. So I finally, uh, I talked to my dad and uh, he said, well son, you know, maybe you ought to think about re retiring. And 38 years and a lot of my buddies were gone, you know, and all, oh, and uh, I still hope to have lived a wonderful life and Still hope I'll have some years ahead of me to enjoy it. Uh, and like I told you earlier, um, some of the greatest people I've ever known I met through the Georgia General Assembly and being a member thereof. But uh, it, it, was, it was a tough decision, but I think in the long run, it, I went out on top. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I was in the state capitol yesterday. And I bet you half a dozen legislators came up and said, we sure wish you were back here running the Appropriations Committee. We <laughs> think we can get things resolved. And I said, well, I miss y'all, but I don't miss being involved. Uh, that, that uh, I don't have any regrets. And looking back, uh, we've got a good delegation from Muskogee County. I'm fortunate to have a wonderful relationship with all of them. And we have always maintained uh, longevity. I mean, you know, uh, Calvin Smyre is a, uh, from Muskogee, and he's been in the house probably about 34 years. And uh, uh, we've got uh, Carolyn Hubley, who's been, she's a, a leader in the, in the Democratic Caucus. She's been there, we've got 10, 15 years. We've always had people that stay there. And, you know, the longer you stay, the longer you, you're either going to move up the ladder mm -hmm. or you ain't going to get reelected. And, uh, so anyway, I don't have any regrets. As you look back over your career, uh, is there anything you might have done differently? Gosh, uh, <clears throat> Bob, I would imagine there a dozen things I'd done differently, but uh, w without having given it any thought, I can't think of anything off the top of my head that would uh, allow me to comment on, on some things. Uh, um, I was very lucky. To, to be where I was, and uh, I think I was somewhat effective when uh, I was in positions to be effective in. Uh, but I don't miss all the fussing and fighting. I told Terry Coleman this one time, I said, you know, the Republican Party would have a caucus about once a week, and the Democratic Party would have a caucus about once a week, and we'd go across the street to, to uh, not the underground, but over behind the Presbyterian Church. I can't remember what we used to call that place, but anyway, we'd have his meetings over there. And I went to Terry Coleman, I said, boss, I love you like a brother, but I said, I ain't going to any more of these Democratic caucus meetings unless you make me go. And he said, why? I said, all you do is sit up there and listen to people argue with each other. I said, you know, I don't, I don't have time for that. And uh, he said, well, if I need you, I'll call you. I said, well, you can do that and I'll come running. But and so he, he, Terry, he could see what was coming. We all, Larry Walker could see what was coming. Jimmy Skipper, a lot, a lot of those have been there for a long time. You could see there's going to be a change. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, the change hadn't really, those that now have the power, I don't think, know how to use it. Mm -hmm. Takes a little time, of course. And mm -hmm. uh, for example, this situation that developed recently would uh, have, have a new speaker in the middle of a term. That's, that's, that's not good. Mm -hmm. uh, I think David Rawson, very qualified, is going to do a good job as speaker, but uh, it just seems to me that they hadn't been able to put their act together mm -hmm. like they should. What has life been like since you uh, left the General Assembly? Well, life's been good. Um, you know, we're here in this, this, this uh, meeting today, and it's in my office, but it used to be where, where I lived when I was born. And uh, my father left us about two years ago. He and I were very close. My mother left us about 10 years ago, 12 years ago. 
And I had two brothers younger than I that uh, have passed and gone to glory. But I've got some stepsons and some step-grandsons that live here, three boys, and have a close relationship with them. And uh, I stay busy uh, volunteering on several boards like uh, the Spring Opera House, which we named the State Theater of Georgia and the River Center for Arts. I'm on that board, St. Francis Hospital, I'm on that board. Um, several other uh, Naval Museum down on the river. Uh, so I, I have those kind of meetings. And, and I'm, I will soon be the next chair of the Board of Trustees at uh, St. Francis Hospital, which will be very demanding. It's already demanding as a vice chair, but uh, I volunteer to do that, and that keeps me busy. But most of all, when the weather's right, is uh, my golf group gets together, usually on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And uh, I've got a condominium that I fortunately have had for 18, 19 years at St. Simon's Island at the King and Prince. So Susan and I get to go down there a lot. And we'll go down and stay five or six days and come home and go back down or whatnot and have friends come down and spend a weekend with us. So I stay pretty busy. I still get up early uh, every morning, and I'm downtown at the coffee shop about seven, and sit there and read the paper. And we don't get the Atlanta paper here anymore. That's I miss that. But I uh, read the paper, and we got a diverse group. We got a, my pastor comes, and uh, we got some law enforcement people come. The sheriff comes, uh, so, several other guys, and just sit there and shoot the bull and talk about what happened the day before, what's going to happen tomorrow, and read the paper again, you know, and it breaks, takes about an hour to get started. Then I go to my daddy's office. Then I come here after I've gone to the post office downtown. So I take care of my business between, say, 8 o'clock and 11 o'clock. And uh, I go to church every Sunday, Sunday school every Sunday. Finally, I've got a full life. Finally, this question. How would you like to be remembered? Well, I would like to be remembered as somebody who made a contribution to the betterment of humanity as far as George is concerned. I would like to be remembered as somebody that was dedicated and a hard worker in a position such as being an elected official. And um, I would like to, to uh, be remembered as somebody that had a very good worth of work ethnic uh, also I enjoy a reputation of being fair and square and honest. Um, several things I, I would like to be remembered, but and I also like to be remembered as somebody that the people had a lot of, my constituency had a lot of confidence in me and my ability, and had given me the privilege to have served for 38 years. So I guess I pretty much covered all that. Well, you certainly have earned that reputation. Well, you're kind. I want to thank you, Tom Buck, on behalf of Young Harris College and the Richard B. Russell Library at the University of Georgia. Well, it's been a real pleasure for me to see you, Bob. I hadn't seen you in several years, but we've known each other for a long time. And I'm honored that you would ask me to be a part of this program. And I look forward to seeing it. <laughs>